function event. Now we are starting recording the event. Uh, so um, everyone knows as well that uh, we will then share some uh, this video with you for those as well that couldn't attend today. Um, as a way of introduction, as you probably know, last year uh, marked the 25th anniversary of the UN Declaration on Human Rights. And as you know, this declaration speaks of the essential role of human rights defenders and the important role that they play in protecting and promoting human rights. However, and despite these huge developments across the globe, human rights defenders continue facing increased intimidation, harassment, criminalization, and even murder for the work that they are doing. In many cases, this number is not only increasing, but also the methods uh, that are being used to silence their voices are being implemented in different regions. And this has been also perpetrated by state and non-state actors. I won't elaborate on this because our panelists will also mention more about this context. But in short, Defenders and UN mechanisms are aware of these situations and have long worked together to hold business accountable for meeting their responsibilities to defend civic freedoms and also to protect human rights defenders. And it's precisely on that spirit that today ISHR is presenting a new tool that will continue helping to articulate with the business and with other actors on those responsibilities and also in, on practical steps that they can take to meet these responsibilities. So before presenting these indicators, I would like first to uh, welcome our three excellent panelists that will also put some context into how we came out with this, uh, with this tool. And uh, first, I would like to give the floor to Kristen Dobson who is the co-head of the Civic Freedoms and Human Rights Defenders Program at the Business and Human Rights Resource Center. Uh, Kristen, could you maybe start giving us a little bit of context of what is the situation of human rights defenders uh, around the globe and what are maybe the risks that they are facing based on the work that the business uh, is doing, the center is doing? Thank you, Ulysses, and it's a pleasure to be here with all of you today. I want to expand on the context that Ulysses started with in sharing that across the globe, we're seeing increasing restrictions on civic space. Civicus, a leading organization on civic space, has found that almost a third of the world's population now lives in countries with closed civic space, and only 2% of the world's population enjoys our freedoms to associate, assemble, and freedom of expression without significant constraints. And this is down from almost 4% five years ago. So we can see that the situation is getting worse. We also see governments cracking down on the right to protest across the globe, including on climate activists, the very people who are championing a just transition and protecting our climate, our land, and environment. At the Resource Center, we track attacks against people who are expressing concerns about business. And since January 2015, we have tracked more than 5,300 instances of attacks worldwide. These have related to almost every business sector and also every region in the world. So every year we see a consistent ongoing pattern of attacks against people exercising their rights um, to protect our collective rights and planet. This is also just the tip of the iceberg. Our research is based on publicly available information and many attacks, especially non-lethal attacks, go unreported, death threats, judicial harassment, other forms of physical violence. So we know the problem is even more severe than this already incredibly high number um, indicates. Also, we track instances of attacks. So when we say 5,300 instances of attacks, that doesn't mean 5,300 people. An instance may be against a large number of unidentified people, such as this past year, we saw cases filed against 11,000 garment workers protesting for higher wages in Bangladesh. Also, attacks on defenders have a much broader effect. They affect defenders' physical safety, mental, emotional, economic well-being. They impact their families, their communities, the human rights movements that they're a part of. And they can also have a chilling effect on the defense of human rights more broadly. As I noted, we see attacks in every, sec uh, every sector. 
but there are three sectors that are consistently since 2015 associated with the highest number of attacks. And that's the mining sector, agribusiness, and oil and gas. And also, unfortunately, we're seeing some attacks related to the renewable energy sector, where it's strong on environmental issues, but not necessarily on social issues. In terms of regions, uh, Latin America and Asia are consistently the most dangerous regions for defenders raising concerns about business. And we see about 75% of the attacks that we've tracked are against people protecting climate, land, and environment. Also, we see a disproportionate number of attacks against Indigenous defenders, who Indigenous people are protecting over 80% of our remaining biodiversity. And even though they comprise about 6% of the world's population, over a fifth of attacks are against them. And 78% of these took place in Latin America. I want to also flag a core driver of attacks. I won't get into all of the drivers, but one really is a lack of adequate consultation prior to projects and a lack of respect for Indigenous people's uh, right to free prior and informed consent. And that includes saying no to projects and not proceeding if that is the answer. So in conclusion, the scale of attacks, we really see it as showing that uh, voluntary corporate action to protect human rights alone has proven insufficient and that states have largely failed in their duty to protect human rights defenders. And so this conversation today focused on indicators, it will really show us another tool that's available in our collective advocacy for the better protection of defenders worldwide. Thank you. Thank you, Alicia, it's back to you. Yeah, thank you so much, Kristen. But also thank you so much for also putting this in context in numbers as well, because sometimes numbers are also important to share, but also to highlight what are the main uh, sectors in which the attacks and intimidation and harassment of human rights defenders occur? Because I think that's very important. But we also don't want to leave it in numbers. We also want to put it into a context of specific situations. And you were mentioning that at least there are two main regions where there are like a high number of attacks against human rights defenders. And to provide us with that context, I would like to now give the floor to Prathana Rao who is currently a program manager at Forum Asia and leads the organization's work on community-centered business and human rights and environmental justice. Uh, Prathana, could you please maybe give us what is actually happening in the region that you are covering and to give us some examples of the actual uh, attacks and intimidation that human rights defenders are facing? Thanks, Ulysses, and hi, everyone. It's lovely to be here. I think uh, from a grassroots perspective, when we talk about human rights defenders find, fighting harmful business operations, and I can speak from the Asian context, and I think we need to first reflect on the climate in which they operate, because the climate very often allows for greater retaliation and reprisals against human rights defenders. And in Asia, this climate is characterized by authoritarianism, shrinking civic space, restrictions on fundamental freedoms, and I think an overall curbing of dissent. And as uh, Christian, uh, Kristen mentioned, um, Asia has one of the highest cases of attacks against human rights defenders. Um, we at Forum Asia also track violations against human rights defenders in the Asian region. And I think we've seen that uh, since Jan 2021, um, for, we recorded about 2,546 cases uh, of violations against human rights defenders. And amongst these, 464 cases uh, are against environmental human rights defenders, land rights defenders, labor rights defenders, and indigenous rights defenders. Um, we also recently published with Contrast Indonesia a joint analysis of the situation of human rights defenders in the region, which um, also highlights a similar trend. So this is extremely worrying because it clearly demonstrates that when there is democratic backsliding, um, it is very easy for states and businesses to use that to their advantage and stifle any sort of critical voice without accountability or justice. And through our network, we are connected to the grassroots who tell us about the ground realities of what it's like uh, to fight corporations um, and to fight governments who usually operate under complete impunity. And any kind of win becomes an almost impossible task. Just to give you a few examples, in the Philippines, uh, we've seen uh, how indigenous women uh, defenders in a community in Didipio uh, 
They told us about how while peacefully protesting mining operations, the police responded with violence, uh, shoved them aside, um, and then with riot shields, tackled them to the ground, handcuffing them, uh, which resulted in severe injuries. In another instance in Mongolia, we have seen that defenders were threatened and their phones tapped, just for, uh, speaking out against mining co uh, corporations. In Kyrgyzstan, a prominent human rights defender was charged with forgery for exposing corruption by the state. Um, and another woman human rights defender lost her job at a university in 1999 because she spoke out against mining operations and since then has still not been able to find stable work. In Indonesia, we see an indigenous human rights defender who was protesting the presence of a company threatened with a gun and eventually arbitrarily arrested and detailed, detained for supposedly stealing equipment from the company. So re realistically, when you as a community-based human rights defender are fighting against corporations and states who have immeasurable power, I think the question becomes, how do you win? There is such an environment of fear being created and operating despite these uh, challenges takes immense strength. It takes fortitude, it takes resilience. And that level of strength and perseverance is also unfair, I think, to demand from any human being. And at the end of the day, I think we need to realize that human rights defenders are also just people and people who are trying to make ends meet and survive. They don't have unlimited resources at their disposal. They don't have free time to keep dedicating to this while they're trying to earn a living. And they don't have lives that are free from responsibilities. And that's why it's important for us to support human rights defenders to make sure that the perpetrators don't use uh, their advantage and continue business as usual. And I think that's why from, I think, a community perspective, what we see is how important it is to support human rights defenders in a very realistic, concrete, context-specific way so that they can continue fighting the good fight at the grassroots level. Uh, so yeah, I think that's the context I'd like to set. And back to you, Ulysses. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pranathana. And also, I think that giving us these specific examples also uh, put, puts on in reality of what's actually happening. And while you are just sharing the context in, in, in Asia, uh, it's to mention that similar contexts are across the globe. And we are also seeing intimidation and harassment in all the regions, including Western countries. And, and that's a reality that we are facing. However, um, this context is not new, and the reality that they are like uh, experiencing are not new. You are just giving us an example from the 90s. And because of this reality that it's not new, also it's not new that there has been some things that have been happening to address this issue from a different perspective, but also from the responsibility of businesses and, uh, and companies. And to give us some of the uh, positive aspects of what has been done and where we are in terms of uh, business responsibilities and these kind of guidelines. Now I would like to give the floor to Bennett Freeman, who is an associate fellow at Chatham House, who is also the lead author of the short space under pressure report that maybe some of you know. And uh, he was also a former US deputy assistant to the secretary of the state for democracy, human rights and labor. Uh, so Bennett, uh, could you please maybe elaborate as well on what has been done, where we are, uh, but also like what is the context in terms of uh, other uh, documents, tools, and principles that has been developed to help the cause? Yeah, thank you, Ulysses. Um, we just heard from Prathana and Christine, uh, Kristen, uh, about the just terrible quantity and severity of attacks against defenders in almost every region around the world that have been so carefully documented. And these attacks come across against the backdrop, the closing of civic space in both country, countries, both with autocratic and de democratic governments alike. And th this remains terrible, terrible news. But as you've just implied, Ulysses, um, we have put together now over the last half dozen years, a whole set of frameworks, initiatives, guidance, tools to address these problems, to reduce these attacks, to uh, 
deter companies to the extent possible for being complicit in these attacks. And I'll very quickly um, outline some of the major frameworks and tools that have been developed over the last half dozen years or so that now give us the ability, if they're implemented, if they're implemented, to reduce attacks, uh, their quantity and their severity, and to reduce, if not eliminate, this pernicious problem of corporate complicity. So it goes back really, I mean, there's all kinds of milestones, but I think it's important just to note first that the German sportswear and apparel company Adidas in 2016 was the first multinational corporation in the world to adopt a standalone uh, hum uh, human rights defenders policy. Uh, it's also important to note that uh, your organization, the International Service for Human Rights and Kristen's uh, Business Human Rights Resource Center, together with B Team, formed in 2017 uh, the Business Network for Civic Freedoms and Human Rights Defenders, uh, initially as a learning platform, but ultimately we hope still as an action platform uh, to bring companies from different sectors together to address these risks and to embrace responsibilities. It was your two organizations, ISHR and the Resource Center, that then commissioned me and a team of researchers to uh, research and write what became the Shared Space Under Pressure Report, uh, the subtitle being Business Support for Civic Freedoms and Human Rights Defenders. It was released in September of 2018. That was based on 90 or so interviews with defenders, NGOs, corporations, governments, uh, uh, around various experts all around the world. Uh, so that became a, a analytical and operational framework to in guide companies to make decisions, often difficult decisions, as to whether and if so how uh, to take action to prevent or, if necessary, mitigate attacks against defenders, as well as to advocate for the safe and enabling space of civic freedoms upon which defenders and indeed all of civil society rely. So that became the, the big comprehensive framework. It was complemented though and reinforced by the development and launch in June of 2021 by the UN Working Group on Business and Human Rights of a similar uh, document, uh, uh, somewhat differently focused, but consistent almost entirely in its substance of the UN Working Group on, on Business and Human Rights produced their guidance on human rights defenders. And there was a particularly sharp focus in that document on due diligence as well as on remedy. So between the UN Working Group document and the shared space under pressure framework, uh, we really had the two complementary, mutually reinforcing frameworks to guide companies uh, to, uh, uh, to begin to tackle these problems and reduce their own complicity. Uh, the further encouraging news is that there's been a further series of guidance and tools that have been developed. The two most significant, uh, before we get up to today's launch of these indicators, um, that were focused on the two sectors with the greatest degree of exposure and attack uh, to defenders, namely agribusiness and extractives, oil, gas, and mining. So last September of 2023, uh, Unilever launched a policy and detailed implementation guidance uh, on human rights defenders, uh, and that is being taken forward not only by that significant company, but also by the Consumer Goods Forum, which is developing a template based on the Unilever document, which we hope will inform companies like Coca-Cola, PepsiCo, uh, Nestle, Procter & Gamble, and many others. Uh, just several months later, just a few months ago now, in December of 2023, the Voluntary Principles Initiative, which supports the Voluntary Principles on Security and Human Rights, launched a, an even more comprehensive and detailed 60 plus plus page guidance uh, on human rights defenders aimed at its company members in both the oil and gas and the mining sectors. And that is being taken forward not only by the VPI Secretariat, but also by the Inter uh, International Council on Mining and Metals on that sector, 
and by IPCA with the oil and gas sector. So there will be significant already or significant dissemination, communication, and training efforts, both in agribusiness and extractives based on the Unilever and VPI guidance. And I should also add quickly that NGOs continue to develop tools and to run campaigns, whether it's the anti-slap campaign run out of Europe uh, or the zero tolerance campaign uh, or the human rights uh, policy, uh, human rights defenders working group coordinated by a number of NGOs. Um, there is significant activity. So I'll just end you know, my, my opening remarks here by saying these problems, these attacks remain. They are pernicious, but we now have the frameworks, guidance documents in the most critical sectors with more to come, tools and initiatives, and adding now today these indicators that now allow us to define and address the problem and the challenge that we'll talk later in this discussion about is how we implement what we have put together over the last half dozen years. That's the big challenge now. Thank you so much, Bennett. Uh, and also, it's, it's a really good reminder that this is not a, a, an isolated document. It, it's also built on many other tools that have been developed, not only by the UN, but also by the civil society actors who are constantly pushing for the implementation of these uh, uh, responsibilities. And maybe this will lead us to properly now launch the indicators and to also show what is it about? You now we are talking about these indicators, but also you are wondering like, what, what's the content? First, I would like to start by saying that um, these indicators are not isolated. And as I mentioned, it builds up to existing documents, but also to human rights law. Um, these are designed to provide a baseline guidance on what is required to monitor from the perspective of the responsibility of businesses to respect the rights of human rights defenders. As Bennett explained, we have come a long way of developing tools. So these indicators come as a complement to all these existing, uh, existing tools. And inspired by the two main documents that uh, Bennett shared, the shared space uh, document report that was uh, designed together by the Business and Human Rights Resource Center and ISHR, but also by the guidelines that Bennett explained that was developed by the Working Group on Business and Human Rights, we are trying to make sure that we are taking a next step. We are not only about uh, pushing companies and businesses and even investors to just do no harm. We are really wanting them to act and if it's necessary to adopt existing policies and guidelines uh, within their uh, businesses, but also to adopt guidelines and uh, policies to make sure that there is a, a implementation of these responsibilities. Uh, we also want to make sure to, to, to understand that while we are not trying to be exhaustive of everything that the company or a business needs to do. We are trying to make sure that there are like at least 10 sections where like companies can do better. Uh, I would like to start with, uh, with this poster that you can see in your, uh, in your screen that while it is not exhaustive of all the content that is in the indicators, at least gives you a little bit of an example of what it's in there. One of the main things that it's important that companies does is like zero tolerance on intimidation attacks and threats against human rights defenders. And for this, the indicators are also making sure that those public commitments and policies that are being established by, by, by these actors comply with a specific uh, uh, content. You will see in the indicators as well that there is like a list of at least um, seven to eight different ways in which you can realize these zero tolerance uh, uh, policies and commitments. We are also seeing that there are a specific section on human rights due diligence. And here I also want to recall what Christian was mentioning related to a meaningful and adequate consultation of communities, particularly on indigenous peoples 
but also on the respect of the free prior and informed consent. You will also see that there are specific indicators regarding consultation and consent. We also see a section on transparency and accountability. And in this way as well, we are making sure that these policies are also known by, by, by the public, because then that would be easier to track. But there is also a way of good faith that uh, companies also make this accessible and also well known. There is also a section on uh, rapid response when they know that there are attacks against human rights defenders. It, uh, it, would, it would be uh, a vacuum document if we shouldn't have included also a section on access to remedies and grievance mechanisms. I think this is one of, uh, of the things that we really want to put emphasis because we really need to make sure that there is accountability. And the only way to make accountability is as well to having these different mechanisms. We also want them to also support civic freedoms to make sure as well that it's not only measures uh, established only for human rights defenders, but in general, to create the conditions as Rathana was explaining, that, that they can operate and work without intimidation and harassment. There are also specific indicators of uh, transparency in ways of UN mechanisms. As we know, more and more the uh, UN experts are also uh, sending communications and letters to companies for their responsibilities. So we also want to make sure that businesses respond adequately to these communications, but not only that they respond, but also that they make sure that their responses are being public. And finally, we also want to make sure that these uh, activities and policies and uh, indicators, indicators are not only applicable to the direct activities of the businesses, but this also extends to other business partners and suppliers. And they should have also similar commitments on this. Uh, I also see that some of the participants are uh, investors. So we also make sure as well to know that there are some indicators that are applicable to them. So anyway, I will leave it here. Uh, as you see, there is a poster that we also developed together with the indicators. We will post the links in the, in the chat so you can have access to this document. And uh, we also would like to have comments by the panelists on these indicators. I, yeah, you have had the chance to also have a look beforehand on this document. You also know about the other existing documents that Bennett has, mentioning, has mentioned. So maybe going back to our speakers, uh, Kristen, uh, I think um, the, as mentioned, these indicators are also another tool in addition to other tools that has been developed by other organizations. Could you please also may, maybe tell us how these indicators could be complementary to other documents or tools that exist out there, but also how do you see that these indicators could be useful for different actors that, are, would, be, that would be relevant for the implementation of uh, these responsibilities? Thank you, Lucy, for the chance to reflect. And I'm really looking forward to hearing reflections from all the panelists as well, uh, other panelists and participants. So I'll just share a few brief reflections. The first one I wanted to make on indicator one, the public policy commitment to respect the rights of human rights defenders and to share with you all where we're seeing the status of progress on that. So in December of last year, some of you may know, the Resource Center launched what we call our policy tracker. So it's a centralized database where you can see which companies have adopted policy commitments. And we're looking at company-wide policy commitments to not tolerate or contribute to attacks on human rights defenders. We base this on the corporate human rights benchmark. So we looked at the 260 companies that CHRB assesses. So those are companies in the extractives, specifically mining and oil, apparel, information and communication technology, food and agricultural products, and automobile sectors. And we found that of the 260 companies that CHRB assessed, 46 of the 260 had made a policy commitment to not tolerate or contribute to attacks against defenders. But then when we looked at the policies based on three just basic CHRB criteria, they have the commitment, they expect the same in their business relationships, 
and that policy commits to actively engaging defenders to create enabling environments for human rights defense, only nine companies met all three CHRB criteria. Now, Bennett, I think, has outlined very clearly that we have made a lot of progress. We have the shared space guidance, the UN Working Group on Business and Human Rights guidance on defenders. Uh, we've seen with starting from Adidas to Unilever, we have seen a number of policies and them getting stronger over time. Unilever is the only one to have implementation guidance to accompany it. We've seen industry associations either in the process of adopting guidance or having released guidance such as VPI. So we do see progress. And though we also see that only nine companies meet these three basic criteria. And then when we look at the mining sector specifically, which is the sector where we see it's connected to the highest number of attacks, only five mining companies assessed by CHRB have a policy commitment to not tolerate or contribute to attacks and no mining companies align with all three indicators. So the policy, applying it to their business relationships and committing to actively engage HRDs on enabling environments. So we, I think there's momentum now that we collectively as civil society focused on these issues can build on to push for more policies, better policies, but then really on implementation as well. And the indicators give us a tool that we can use to do that. Just another tool as part of this body to show that this is the expectation for companies. This is their responsibility. This is what they need to do. Uh, for companies, I think this is a really, the indicators are a really helpful tool to just understand what's expected of you to support you in developing your policies and implementation guidance, and also in your grievance mechanisms. Uh, for investors, it's a helpful tool for your own policies. Also for you to think about questions to ask in your engagement with portfolio companies about their policies with respect to defenders, about their human rights due diligence, how they're assessing risks to defenders. And then also, I think it provides investors with guidance to inform action when an attack has occurred against a defender connected to one of their portfolio companies. And the shared space document that Bennett referenced earlier also gives a number of examples where companies have taken action in the past and investors as well. And then finally, with civil society, for us, I think it's just a really helpful shared reference that we can use in our advocacy with companies and investors and also governments so that they really understand what the company responsibility is. Uh, so looking forward to hearing from the other panelists and, and also those of you here in the virtual room. Thank you so much, uh, Kristen. And that's also a, a really good reminder for also our um, the people who is attending to this uh, presentation. In case you have any question and answer, I know that maybe you haven't had the time to go through all the indicators, but also try to make sure that we can take advantage of the presence of these three speakers in case you have any, any, any question in, in, in particular. And also to mention that we have been sharing in the chat some of the documents that uh, the panelists have been mentioning um, that you can also use as a reference uh, and then you, you, you know what we are uh, talking about. But uh, Kristen, you, you already shared like how this could be used by, by, by companies and, and how this complement other, uh, other tools out there. But uh, going now back to Prathana, because you, 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 you mentioned the reality of human rights defenders. And we would like to know as well how, if at all, these indicators could also help on uh, responding to the human rights defenders' realities that they are facing. And maybe also to give a little bit of what needs to be done, by who, but also if there is something missing from these documents that you think should be elaborated further. So, Prathana. Sure, thank you, Lucas. And absolutely, I think these indicators can be used by civil society. And congratulations to everyone who has contributed to developing it. I think it provides much needed guidance on the role that businesses can play in respecting the rights of human rights defenders. And I think it's sometimes difficult to find indicators that are in easy language. I think in attractive looking infographics, um, you know, it just gives you a snapshot of all that businesses can do to protect human rights defenders. And I think the indicators that you've developed uh, really provide information in a very easily digestible way. So hats off to you and the team for developing that. I think in terms of the usefulness for civil society, um, 
these indicators are definitely a way for civil society to advocate for greater, I think, awareness as well as responsibility for businesses in the region. Um, but that also works on the principle that the indicators need to be thoroughly followed and respected by businesses. Um, and as Kristen mentioned, that while there are examples of businesses and corporations that thoroughly follow different benchmarks and principles, they're few and far between. Um, to expect businesses who usually function on profit um, out of their goodness of their hearts or out of a fully functioning moral compass as a majority, of course, there are exceptions, uh, but um, to expect businesses to follow the indicators, it, it could be life-changing, but it doesn't happen very often. So in the spirit of, again, grounding us, there are just three things that I wanted to highlight um, of things that we need to keep in mind when we talk about the business uh, and businesses' responsibilities, as well as the role of civil society. Um, I think firstly is around the bigger picture of the responsibility of companies. And I think we need to place greater responsibility on companies to not invest in countries that have repressive laws in the first place. Because at the end of the day, it is mixed messaging. Um, if companies invest millions of dollars in countries that have problematic human rights track record and then miraculously expect policies um, to protect and support human rights defenders to function, um, because when the entire system is designed to penalize tho those exercising their human rights, how can we expect company policies which require functioning judiciaries, which require functioning police systems, functioning governments, how do we expect these policies then to make a real difference? And just to give you an example, if I was, a, if I was to start an automobile parts manufacturing facility in Myanmar, and my company has robust policies on human rights, due diligence, com community consultations, grievance mechanisms, independent accountability systems. How will this realistically work in the context of Myanmar? So does it make any sense to expect that there will be genuine respect for human rights defenders? No. So I think that's the first thing I wanted to highlight is that we need to hold companies responsible for the places that they choose to invest in in the first place and expect them to uphold democracy, the principles of democracy and human rights in their initial investments. I think the second thing I wanted to highlight is the emphasis on the supply chain, especially coming from the Asian context. There are many levels of separation between investors, companies, and suppliers on the ground. And vendors at the most basic grassroots level, at least in the Asian context, are usually unregistered or uh, belong to the informal economy. They aren't they are the ones that are offer the cheapest rates because they use cheap labor. They don't have policies. They don't have strong rights-based legal frameworks. Uh, even the countries that they operate in don't have legal frameworks that are strong and human rights-based. So at the end of the day, if we consider that the bottom line is profit and companies and investors benefit from these lower costs that come with hiring uh, cheap labor. So when it comes to actually supporting human rights, how do we apply that in the context where realistically it's almost impossible to, to keep track of every layer of the supply chain? Do you know who's driving workers to and from your factories and trucks? Are those truck drivers paid well? So I think we need to pay a lot of attention on supply chains and how we can ensure that companies really employ human rights frameworks in every aspect of who they hire and not just focus on profits. And I think lastly, the point I wanted to highlight, and I would be remiss for not highlighting this, is that in all of this, the onus still remains on HRDs and human rights defenders. If businesses don't adhere to policies and contribute to human rights violation, who is expected to take further action? It's communities, it's human rights defenders. Who has to get policies translated, understand them, when there's a violation, go through the necessary protocol to start the investigation, then provide paperwork, attend meetings, hire experts, to gather proof, follow up uh, actions. Who's expected to do all that? Communities and human rights defenders. And in some ways, that onus still remains unfair because we're again placing unrealistic, almost superhero-like responsibilities on just ordinary individuals. And we, we need, I think, to think about 
how some of that burden can be shifted more sustainably on companies themselves um, so that in a way it still remains independent and impartial and we make sure that there's no bias created in different investigations, but at the same time, the onus is not solely on the human rights defenders. Um, and we need to stop placing such high expectations on human rights defenders to give up their lives, their families for a cause. And in some way, we need to stop normalizing and celebrating human rights defenders as martyrs and find a way to support them sustainably. Because the, actually the fact that so many human rights defenders are looked up to, are idolized, are commemorated, is a sign of an extremely broken system. So I think overall, we need we really need to be aware of the ground realities and see the bigger picture. Instead of, I think, suggesting topical band-aids over the wounds. Um, so I think these are some things that we really need to keep in mind while we develop policies, while we develop indicators, while we work with communities, while we work with governments, corporations, to ensure that they're genuinely human rights friendly. Thank you. Thank you so much, Prathana. And I and I and I think that highlighting what you just mentioned of coherence, but also this unbalanced situation that exists also uh, help to realize how pressing the situation is and how much businesses could do to unbalance the situation. And already uh, Bennett was mentioning uh, a key word uh, in his first presentation, which was implementation. And Bennett, if you could maybe elaborate a little bit more on what needs to be done from the company's perspective and also responding a little bit on this unbalanced situation that Prathana was uh, mentioning, which is a reality. So please go ahead. If you can unmute, uh, Bennett. Perfect. Um first on you know encouraging companies and for that matter investors to think hard about where they operate and to try to avoid if possible companies where there's huge concentrations of tax against defenders and severe restrictions on civic freedoms but i also like the emphasis on supply chains and i would note that the major operational thrust of the unilever implementation guidelines are on their relationships with suppliers around the world throughout their agricultural, mostly agricultural supply chains, critically important. So look, on implementation, as difficult as it may be to create policies and develop detailed implementation guidance, it's, in, in my view, it's actually less difficult than implementation. And I don't think it's reasonable to assume that even for companies that are committed to addressing these issues, that implementation is easy. Uh, and that's not to let them off the hook, but it's to inject a dose of reality of the kinds of implementation challenges and dilemmas that they face. And the real purpose of both the, uh, the shared space report, the, the UN working group guidance, and now the Unilever and VPI guidance is to work through not just policy commitments, but implementation challenges. So one of those challenges is very simple, and that is how do you join up a, a company, uh, both at the corporate headquarters level, but the field operations level to be aligned around common policies and procedures? How do you line up the right internal functions, compliance, supply chain operations, security, legal, communications, public affairs, government relations, all, almost all of those um, uh, functions need to be aligned on both the preventative and reactive side of implementing these kinds of policies and procedures. Uh, another dilemma, which I have to say is one that probably keeps companies awake at night uh, to the extent they worry and should worry about these issues, is that def uh, protecting defenders in, 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 against attack and supporting civic freedoms almost by definition puts the company in some degree of tension, if not conflict, if not implicit opposition to a home, a host country government where it operates or from where it sources. That is not a desirable position from a company perspective. And yet, it is inescapable that companies will have some friction 
uh, with host country governments to the extent that they are trying to maintain a safe and enabling environment uh, for defenders and to help defenders in certain circumstances. So that's why the government affairs people are particularly important to be aligned here, not just legal and supply chain operations and some of the others. And then that brings also, uh, raises also the implementation dilemma for companies that we address really extensively in the original shared space under pressure report that's also addressed in the Unilever and VPI guidance. And that is when a company does have to act, does it speak publicly or does it talk quietly behind the scenes? And where we came down in the shared space report and in those subsequent documents is it's not one or the other, it's either or both, depending on the circumstance and the situation and in consultation with local communities, defenders, and civil society. Sometimes it'll make more sense for a company initially to have a quiet private word with a government minister to deter a threat or an attack. Sometimes a public statement is absolutely essential. But these are sometimes tough dilemmas and it's also important to engage the home country governments of these multinational corporations, especially through their embassies, um, half a dozen or more uh, home country governments of major multinational corporations advise their companies on business and human rights issues, including defenders. The U.S. government probably has the most extensive process now of guidance and procedures with embassies and consulates around the world, focusing partly on defenders. And they just released uh, a new document just two weeks ago about supporting online defenders. So there is help here for companies. And then one final dilemma I want to mention, and I think is a good one to close on for me, is I've heard over and over again from companies in different industries that they're not always sure who's really a human rights defender, who's legitimate, or who is just sort of claiming to be a defender. And what we have written over and over and said in public sessions and in private meetings over and over again is there's a diversity, a range of people who are defenders. Yes, some may not enjoy full support or legitimacy among their communities, but that's the case with civil society and the world we live in. That said, the important thing is to respect the rights and to hear the voices of everyone, especially those who are critics of the company. So companies shouldn't be picking and choosing as to who they think are real defenders or not. They need to give the benefit of the doubt. They need to protect everybody's rights and security, and they need to build strong relationships with defenders, with local communities, through persistent consultation and engagement so they can understand the dynamics that they have to navigate. So frankly, you know, I hear this over and over again, and we, I just reject the excuses that we don't know who's a real defender. Sure, it's complicated sometimes, but talk, listen, engage and protect the rights of everyone is the right thing to do here. There are no excuses. These attacks continue. So that I think is important. And we're only going to get make real progress to the extent that corporate complicity in these attacks diminishes over time, especially in these high exposure uh, uh, sectors that we're addressing, ag agribusiness, um, extractives, and now tech and others to come. And ultimately, we need through the actions of companies, positive, responsible actions of companies to help diminish the distrust that defenders and local communities, for good reason, have had towards companies now for so many years in so many communities and countries around the world. So there's hope here. We have a hell of a lot of work to do. Implementation, commitment is the start. Implementation then is where we're moving now. Our work is cut out for us, and these indicators help big time. Thank you so much, Bennett, and but also to provide in with like really concrete ways in which they could start implementing uh, these indicators. I know that we are uh, uh, closer to the end of uh, of this, but I there are some uh, questions that are posted already. So I will just read them out and then give the floor uh, back again for those who would like to comment on this. And um, also for the uh, attendees, if you would like to just stay for additional five minutes, uh, that would be great. So we can also answer to some of these questions. 
So I will just uh, read them and then uh, we will uh, go with the answers. So there is one that says that, should we be moving towards red lines more than guidance, like when businesses consider engaging in context or with the states that systematically violate international law, including abuses towards human rights defenders? For example, what impact would the ICJ's funding for possible genocide have on business operating in or with relationship with Israel, where there has been widespread targeted of human rights defenders? So that's one question. The second is, um, will there be efforts to assess companies against the indicators that you shared? Which indicators do companies struggle with the most? Does the publication also share examples of good practice? And one, this is uh, for, for specifically for Prathana. On what basis should investors decide whether or not to invest in repressive regimes? What are the red lines? Should that decision not be made in conjunction with civil society actors to include impacted communities? Anyway, I, uh, I, I just read the, the, the questions and then I will open the floor for maybe reactions because I think that some uh, comments could also uh, respond to various of these, of these questions. So I will start maybe with the more uh, direct question relate, related to good practices. No, these uh, indicators do not share examples of good practices as mentioned. This is a, a, a guidance, it's a baseline. You know? And it's what sometimes we are, it's our wishing list we would say of what companies should do. And this doesn't mean that some of them have done it already. However, as Bennett uh, explained, there has been some good practices and good examples of some companies who are going into the right direction or into that specific direction. So hopefully later as a follow-up, it could be good that thanks to the uh, implementation of these indicators, then we can have some good practices of how to implement this. And I guess that um, it would depend also on businesses that they provide us with those good practices. Um, I think in terms of assessment, uh, that's huge, but uh, there are already uh, other uh, organizations who are already assessing and constantly are uh, releasing some of these uh, exercises. Uh, I mean, not to put in the spot uh, the Business and Human Rights Resource Center, but they do an excellent job on assessing and tracking uh, companies' behavior. So uh, hopefully these indicators could also help that exercise that the Business and Human Rights Resource Center is doing. So I will respond to those ones. Uh, maybe Kristen, if you want to maybe elaborate on on something. I'm happy to share a few thoughts and thank you for the questions. So with respect to the indicators and assessing, we don't have plans at the moment to assess directly against the indicators, as Ulysses said, but we're always tracking at the resource center attacks against human rights defenders, raising concerns about business harm. And then we also have a number of different benchmarks and other partners have benchmarks like CHRB, for example, where we're tracking these issues. Um, I want to talk just briefly to the first question about should we be moving towards red lines more than guidance? I mean, my perspective is absolutely we need to be moving more towards binding legislation and a binding treaty on business and human rights. We have seen that, you know, we have many years of voluntary guidance with four companies, and we still see an ongoing, consistent pattern of attacks against people raising concerns against um, business, about business. And so we, this, these indicators, I think are helpful guidance and we, it is useful to have guidance. And at the same time, we're also doing advocacy and influencing work related to the binding, leg binding legislation. For example, we were um, active related to CSDDD in the EU and trying to ensure that language around defenders and stakeholder engagement was included. So we need a variety of tools to uh, hold companies accountable for human rights abuses and attacks to defenders. This guidance I think is useful and we also need to be doing work on, on binding legislation. And uh, yeah, I think I'll, I'll pause there. Oh, I do see a new question, maybe say, are there particular challenges that environmental human rights defenders face than other human rights defenders? Uh, maybe just a brief comment on this. I mentioned earlier that you know, about three quarters of the attacks that we track are against people raising concerns about land rights, environmental rights, and the climate. 
one tactic that we see, you know, more and more in climate related activism is civil disobedience. Uh, if you haven't read it yet, Michelle Forst, the UN Special Rapporteur on Environmental Defenders under the Our House Convention released, I think, a really excellent paper about civil disobedience and the crackdown on that across the EU. So that's a resource I would recommend. But I think we see similar types of attacks being used against defenders working on a range of issues, whether they're environmental defenders working on labor, it's, you know, smear campaigns, death threats, um, judicial harassment, criminalization. So it's similar types of attacks. Uh, there are patterns and it's, it's a lot of similar root causes, as I mentioned earlier, around lack of consultation, racism and discrimination, um, the closing civic space and restrictions on civic freedoms. But we, yeah, I think we're out of time, but we'd be happy to discuss that further. Thank you so much, Kristen. Uh, Rathana, if you want to also. Sure, maybe just to quickly add, and Rebecca, thank you for your question. I think in terms of your, your, the first part of the question, which is on what basis should investors decide whether or not to invest in repressive regimes? I think the simple answer is, if it is classified a repressive regime, you should not invest in that uh, country. Because I think when it is a repressive regime, it automatically means that there aren't, uh, the legal frameworks don't exist. Vibrant civil society doesn't exist to fight back, to voice their opinions. And I think the that decision is should be informed by policies that investors usually have, whether it's uh, ESF, ESG, uh, there are different uh, independent accountability policies. So I think there are different policies that investors already have with, uh, integrated into their investing um, that informs to what extent they should and should not invest in different uh, sites in different countries. And at the same time, civil society does a really good job of tracking which countries uh, have higher civic freedoms, have lower civic freedoms. Uh, uh, and that is informed by whether, for example, in which countries media workers are targeted for speaking up, in which countries <clears throat> environmental human rights defenders um, have fraudulent tax evasion charges placed on them for uh, just speaking up against business operations. So I think if investors' policies are informed by civil society research indicators, and that can form a very robust framework for deciding where to invest and where not to invest. Um, Kristen mentioned this Civicus Monitor at the beginning where she said that they track exactly which countries are open, which are repressed, which are closed. That can be a benchmark for decide for investors to decide um, which countries to invest in, or which, which, which countries have closed civic space, which means that the red line has been crossed and that you should not invest in them. And in terms of consultation with communities and civil society actors um, while making this decision, I think absolutely in an ideal world, governments would involve civil society and communities right from the start when deciding whether they should invest in a project anyway. But we know that that doesn't happen. We know that communities are usually consulted as an afterthought, just as, as a checkbox exercise. So I think in, in a real world situation where communities aren't the foundation of the discussion, uh, but are just secondary to the discussion. I think we realistically expecting uh, it to be a collaborative effort is not going to happen. So I think that's when investors need to play a bigger role in ensuring that where they invest in actually respects civic space. Thank you. Thank you so much, Prathana. And I also would like to give the uh, Bennett in case you have uh, further uh, reflections or additional comments or answers to the questions. If you can unmute yourself, please. Asked in the interest of time here, um, you know, but I'm, I know many of you on the call and happy to discuss some of these issues in detail as I continue my work with um, all of Prathana and, and, and Kristen and you, Ulysses and many others. So I'm happy to leave it at that for now. Thank you so much, Bennett. And uh, we are running out of time. Also, maybe just like additional comments. Uh, it's true, I think that uh, it's real that environmental human rights defenders uh, right now are those who are most at risk. And I think that one of the responses to this is that right now we do have clear 
binding obligations towards environmental human rights defenders. I think that uh, the Aarhus Convention and the ESCOSU Agreement, two regional uh, um, frameworks, were actually providing legal obligations to states. And eventually, this would also mean that businesses need to adapt to those uh, uh, legislations when implemented. Are just the clear examples of the risks and the reality of environmental human rights defenders. So I think as well that we need to anticipate. And I think that's maybe uh, a way that we would like to, um, to, to close. I think businesses also need to anticipate because uh, there are not only voluntary guidelines that are being developed. We are also looking at legally binding rules that are being developed in order to make sure that the businesses are accountable. So if, if we continue working together, not only with the side of these guidelines and indicators and make sure that companies are also working in good faith, we are also anticipating and be prepared whenever these binding rules are coming. And I think it's just a good example in which like we can collaborate together. Um, also uh, to make sure that companies are also acting, adapting and adopting what is needed to be done to make sure that the work of human rights defenders are being done in a safe space. And enabling that space and going back maybe to some of the things that we are uh, sharing already is to recognize that we are in a shared space and it's a responsibility not only for uh, the states but also for businesses and also for everyone to make sure that human rights defenders can work and really protect what others are not protecting. So we hope that uh, these indicators are useful. We hope as well that you can have the time to look at them and really to continue the conversation. If you have any further questions, either in the context of the indicators, but also to our panelists, please feel free to share, to send it, and we will make sure to, to share with the panelists. Um, without that, I would like only to thank our uh, three panelists, uh, Prathana, Benneth, and Kristen for your time and for giving us some uh, very useful information and comments, but also to everyone who was here, uh, it shows your interest, but also hopefully you can also share part of this document and recommendations and comments uh, with others. Uh, thank you so much, have, have a really nice day and looking forward to continue conversations like this one. Thank you everyone, thank you. bye. Bye.